Ever wonder what the European Space Agency astronaut selection process is like? Well, I found out today, specifically the medical assessment. So what kind of medical assessment goes on to selecting an astronaut? What kind of things do they look out for? And how healthy do you really have to be? Well, I spoke with an ESA flight surgeon, Stephen Alamo from France, who told me all. So stay tuned and let's get into it. So firstly, what is a flight surgeon and what is the role of a flight surgeon for the European Space Agency? A flight surgeon's mission is to ensure the health of an astronaut before flight, during flight and post flight. The flight surgeon's role is in implementing the health and medical procedures involved in the ISS, the Lunar Gateway and the Artemis missions. So how can someone become a flight surgeon? So firstly, all flight surgeons are required to become clinicians. So a clinician is basically a doctor, someone who has direct involvement in treating patients. So Stefan is an emergency physician and an attending physician in Toulouse. He has done some research with Meta at the Space Medicine and Physiology Institute, and he has a diploma in aerospace medicine. His main skill is as a clinician. You can't say that you want to work for space. Uh, you have to have a curriculum before that um, on particular skills and if you get the job it's because you have these skills um, my colleague uh, right now we are in training with my colleague we just finished our training as a uh, surgeon for ESA uh, Alessandro who is uh, Italian uh, is a military doctor for the Italian uh, Navy so what are the different phases involved in astronaut selection and what are the medical requirements uh, the medical assessment for the astronaut selection is the last part, the very, very last part. So in March 2021, the European Space Agency had an astronaut selection call and 22,523 people applied. So of those, 1,362 actually made it to stage two and 29 made it who were physically disabled. And stage two was the psychometric selection phase. Stage two focused on the psychological performance of the candidates and included cognitive, technical, motor coordination and personality tests. And if a candidate was successful, they moved on to the psychological interviews and group tests before the medical assessment. So of those 1,362, 400 made it to stage three, which involved psychological assessments, team building assessments, and also assessments to check how well the candidate performed under pressure. And this was all done in Cologne, Germany. So we have 400 candidates who've gone through all this testing. From those 400, 96 made it to the final stage, the medical assessment. Half were based in Cologne and the other half in Toulouse, France. The medical assessment involves a max stress test for cardiovascular capacity, ultrasound of the stomach and abdomen, a thyroid check, chest x-ray, brain MRI, blood test to assess hormones, blood cell count, and a psychological assessment. Now, the surprising thing, there isn't any like official fitness test. I mean, there's a max stress test and a VO2 max, but even with this, there's no thresholds that the candidates need to meet in order to pass. The max stress test for cardiovascular um, capacities, all the candidates are doing sports or are fit and are in good shape, but there is no threshold, there is nothing, there is no maximum or minimum limits. It's only medical purpose to see if there is any pathology or underlying condition that can, can have um, mission impact, but they are all in shape. So in the past, what have been some of the main reasons that some candidates have failed the medical assessment? So the main reason that some people fail the medical assessment is due to ophthalmological reasons. So what do I mean by this? Well, I don't mean uh, wearing glasses or contact lenses. Actually, sometimes this isn't a deal breaker and it could still mean you can get through. But when I say ophthalmological, I'm talking about things which are a little bit deeper and harder to see, and I'm not generally saying it literally. It's actually harder to notice that you have these kind of issues because you need scans and quite a few of them. So glasses and contact lenses aren't the actual deal break. Rather, ophthalmological reasons could actually be harder to detect. 
And these are reasons that are beyond, for example, like I mentioned, glasses and contact lenses. So for example, issues with the optic nerve, um, color blindness or atrophy, but rather an ophthalmological assessment could actually shine a light on things that you wouldn't even be aware of. So that means things such as color blindness issues, optic nerve problems or atrophy. And some of these could mean a deal breaker. The assessments that are carried out in this are for example, an MRI, a fundoscopy, or an OCT, a CT scan at the back of the eye. Fundoscopy, what we call fundoscopy, which is the exam of the retina. So is there an ideal build and height of an astronaut? So the height and length requirements are actually due to operational reasons. So the candidate has to be able to fit EVA suits that ESA offers. So the minimum height is 149.5 centimeters and the maximum 190.5 centimeters. But this is just for the Soyuz suit. Uh, we have what we call during the medical selection anthropometry, which is the measurement of the length of the arms, legs, the chest grill, and abdominal perimeter and everything. But the only limits are the suits. So how does the role of a flight surgeon change from pre-flight, during flight and post-flight? So during the pre-flight stage, there are two main goals. The astronaut is healthy and the medical procedures are ready for flight. So for example, all the pre-flight training is done, completed and the astronaut is ready and capable. And secondly, that all the in-flight medication is also ready to go. Additionally, the flight surgeon checks all the research that will be done up in the International Space Station by the astronaut. So during the flight stage, the goal is to maintain the astronaut's health in flight. So you have to monitor the astronaut's nutrition, their exercise, which they have to do two hours a day, the medication they're taking, and space sickness. They have weekly check-ins to discuss any and every issue they may be having medically. Then in the post-flight stage, the flight surgeon helps the astronaut adapt back to Earth. So this is the rehabilitation stage. So the flight surgeon still monitors the experiments that are done on the astronaut and their health when they're back, but they also have to make sure that this is not hindering the astronaut's health. Then, what we call deconditioning is when you go back to Earth because the function is also new because after six months, you get a very good adaptation for space. You're kind of adapt to the existing environment. Same for your inner ear, for your brain, your visual perception and everything. You're adapt for space. It's not good because you lose bone, you have more cardiovascular risk. So as I've spoken about in previous episodes, we're planning to go to the moon and Mars. So how exactly will the medical assessment and requirements change as we go to the moon and Mars? Firstly, going to Mars is a one year trip. It takes about seven months to get to Mars. And when you're there, you're there isolated with just your crew members. Remember, trying to contact Earth isn't as quick as you would be able to when you're up in the ISS. There's a lag. So there's that feeling of isolation, which means that the crew that you have is pretty much all you have. Firstly, the trip to Mars will be a lot longer. It could be a year long or even longer than that. Getting to Mars is on average about seven months anyway. So imagine that there's space travel and then there's actually going to Mars. And when you're on Mars, you're gonna be there with your crew and your crew are going to be the main people that you speak with. You see, when you're in the International Space Station, you have almost constant communication with um with earth and with the mission control but when you're on mars it's going to be a lag and that lag could hinder like certain problems being solved quickly so you really have to rely on your crew and it can be quite an isolating feeling being away from earth for that long but there's a lot of research done to try and mitigate this and see how certain processes and technology can be used to help provide support to astronauts when they're on the moon or on mars and the flight surgeon's role is being developed to see how they can best support this kind of mission. It may be necessary that you'll need an onboard surgeon, not just a doctor. For example, there are surgeons that work in submarines that are well versed at performing surgeries in remote areas, isolated from the outside world. So the next episode will look at this even further. How would the moon or Mars affect someone's physiology? And how could we prepare for such missions? So watch this space. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm gonna be posting more videos on the European Space Agency astronaut selection process with people within the agencies. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, stay safe and hopefully one day I will see you in space.